to share with you some of the things that are on my heart. So back in November, I want to say this particularly for you that are new here so that you have some context and where we're going um, this morning and, and what the Lord's really placed on my heart. Um, back in November, as, as, I was, uh, as, as we were changing planes in Atlanta, Georgia, as I got off of the plane, um, the Lord... I mean, he just, he started talking to me. It was just like, it was one of those God encounters that I wasn't really aware of much of what was going on. He said this, he said, the kingdom of God enters into the earth through the hearts of men. I mean, I heard that as clear as anything. The kingdom of God enters into the earth through the hearts of men. I said, okay, Lord, talk to me about that. What are you saying? And, and so As I'm walking, you know, Jennifer and Olivia were way ahead trying to get to our next plane. And and so I'm walking. Jennifer said, are you okay? I said, I'm having a conversation with God right now. Y'all just keep going. And so he just began to talk to me. He gave me a vision. He gave me a vision of this church. Um, And and what I saw is like I was looking down on the building. So like I was maybe 100 feet up in the air looking down on the building. And I saw through the building, I saw just this grove of trees and you could see the, the, uh, the leaves and the tops of the trees through the top of the building. And I immediately knew that each one of those trees represented you. Each one of the Bible says that we are called trees of righteousness. And, and so what he was showing me was, was the people here at Life of Faith Church. Now, this, is, this isn't just for our church. He was actually talking to me about how the kingdom of God operates in churches in general. And, and, so, and what he said is that, that every resource that our church needs, our, this, is a, this is a kingdom outpost. This is a place of the kingdom. This is a place where sickness is not allowed to reign. Amen. This is a place where sin is not allowed to reign. This is a place where the king of kings reigns. He should reign in our heart. He should reign in our life. But we say that Man, we are a place of healing. Come to get healed. Come to get free. Our Monday night I Am Free sessions, we've got 50 people that are coming that have been uh, dealing with addiction or that have been dealing with some, some area of, of stress or depression or oppression in their life. And they're coming and they're getting free, praise God. This is a freedom place. Amen? And so, and so, and so every resource... That, we, that, that is needed right here at this church to accomplish what God has called us to accomplish for where we are in our season is in the hearts of the people. It's in every person that is here right now. Whether it's a worship team, I mean, thank God for our worship team, praise God. Whether it's to serve in some other area, whether it's to help with children's ministry, whether it's to volunteer, whether it's to help financially, whatever that is, every resource is in you because the kingdom of God is in you. And if we will learn to allow the kingdom of God that is in us, that's what Jesus said. He said, you won't be saying there's the kingdom or here's the kingdom. He said, for the kingdom of God is within you. And so Jesus came so that we could be connected to his kingdom, so we could experience his flow. We could experience his rule. We could experience his life. We could experience his dominion, praise God. And so that we'll walk in that. We are connected to him. He is king. King of kings, Lord of lords, and we are those kings and we are those lords that are to be his expression and his ambassadors here on the earth. We, he's the head, we're the body, glory to God. Mm. And so we get to use those gifts and those callings and, and whatever God has blessed us with to, to work together to expand the kingdom. And so the kingdom of God, as we connect to that in our hearts, begins to be expressed and lived out in our life. And so that that Romans chapter 8 says that um, this earth is waiting. This world is waiting. All of creation is waiting. It's waiting for something. It's waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. It's waiting for people to rise up and to say, I'm not going to just be concerned about 
myself and just concerned about my family, but rather I'm going to connect with the kingdom and I'm going to work together uh, uh, with other people. And we're going to we're going to be a demonstration of Christ here on the earth. I mean, he says that we are more than conquerors. We are to demonstrate his victory. Uh, uh, when Jesus came, he said, the kingdom of God is at hand. And so when we're, when, when we're singing that song, we want to see your kingdom now. The fact of the matter is, we can want to see it, but we got to start living it. we got to start declaring it, because the kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God is in us. And so we've got to be kingdom-minded, not worldly-minded. I'm not trying to obtain victory. I'm not trying to obtain healing. I'm not trying to obtain a new way of life. It has already been given to me. There's already a new way for me to live in glory to God. Everything that I possibly can need for life and godliness, 2 Peter chapter 1 says, has already been given unto me. And so what we've been talking about this year is about what living in the kingdom looks like. What does it mean? I mean, let's not just use religious terms. Let's not just use something that our church is used to hearing. You know, we're talking about kingdom, kingdom kingdom-minded and all of that. No, kingdom is very practical. Kingdom is a rule. Kingdom is dominion. There's a king that's involved in that. Jesus said, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, that is proof to you that the kingdom of God is here. That means no devil can stand to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That means no, I mean, when he, when he, when he healed the sick, it wasn't just because he was the son of God. It's because he was a king and there was a new kingdom in town and sickness is illegal. I'm telling you, uh, and if this is new for you and if you haven't heard this before, I'm telling you, Jesus came. Listen to me. Jesus came to deliver us. The thief comes not, the Bible says in John 10, 10, but for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. That's Satan. There's other things in your life that will want to try to steal and to kill and to rob from you. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, it says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Praise God. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost didn't go away with the death of the last apostle. The Holy Ghost still lives and reigns. And right now, right now, Wendy, you kind of saw some of that down in, uh, in Panama when you went on your missions trip. I mean, she came back saying, we were watching the book of Acts unfold before our very eyes. I mean, it was awesome. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed by the devil. I'm telling you, Jesus is not just the savior of your soul. He is the healer of your body. And I just feel like that right now that there may be some of you here this morning that you've been dealing with sickness, that you've been dealing with things that that you've not been able to get free from. And so, so just let's just lift our if, if you're if, if you're comfortable doing this, just lift your hands towards heaven. Let's let the Spirit of God right now do. The Bible says in Romans chapter eight, verse eleven, if the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, that same Spirit that raised up that lifeless body, it says He will also quicken, give life to, give health to your body by that Spirit. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, Jesus, you're the healer. Jesus, you came that we might be healed, that we might be set free, that we don't have to wait till we get to heaven to experience that. But right now, your power is available, not Not to come from the outside in, but it's from the inside out. That the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells on the inside of me. That same spirit that says that I'm a son of God. I'm a child of God. I'm a daughter of God. That same spirit that's, that's, that's saying, I'm in the same union with you, Father, that Jesus himself was in union. In the name of Jesus. I speak to sickness. I command it to leave now in Jesus' name. I speak to disease. I command it to leave now in the name of Jesus. You have no legal right or authority to to stay in a person that is part of the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. So we command you to go now in Jesus' name. 
In Jesus' name. Where there is weakness, I speak strength. Where there's depression, I speak life. A new joy in the name of Jesus. Jesus, we give you honor. We yield to you. Thank you for doing your work in Jesus' name. You receive that? Praise God. Hallelujah. Turn with me over to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. I'm going to kind of get into some things this morning for the next 20 minutes or so as we begin to uh, what we're learning. Man, somebody just got free. God. Uh, what we're learning is about what life in the kingdom looks like. Jesus didn't come just to show us what a blessed life looks like. He came to show us what his character, how his character and nature, what that looks like and what it means to be in union with him and how we can live that life, live that union. You live that. What, what's the expression of that? What's the practical effects that living in the kingdom looks like? Again, I'm not talking about some spiritual, you know, mysterious thing. Kingdom, kingdom, I wish I could see it kind of thing. No, he came to practically change our life. But he also came to demonstrate what living life as a king on the earth looks like. There's a, change, there's a change in your heart. There's a change in your life. There's a change in your thinking. That's why Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, Be not conformed to, the, to this world. Don't, be, don't think like the world. Don't act like the world. You don't, you don't want to live that way because that way is going to create death in your life. He says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And when you do that, you'll prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. And so we looked at last week... Verse uh, 22, Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you will eat, neither for the body what you shall put on. The life is more, your life is more than what you eat. The body's more than what you put on. In other words, the kingdom of heaven has a different value system. Our world has a value system that would say, you know, you got to work five, six days a week, get as much as you can and, and just, you know, just keep, keep on keeping on and, and see if you can keep up with the Joneses and the people next door and live the American dream and become financially independent and all that kind of stuff. And, and that's not heaven's value system. Heaven's value system isn't for us to, to continue to live for our own way and for our selfish ways and to live according to the flesh. No, heaven's value system, you look at Romans chapter 8, isn't about living after the world or living after a fleshly mindset. It's about living after the Spirit and walking after the Spirit. And so here he's saying your life is more important. And so he begins talking about that. And I'm not going to recap last week, but he goes down to verse 31 and, and he says, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter six, verse 33 says, seek first the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean you never, you, you never pay attention to, to, to what you're going to eat or those kinds of things, but it says, seek first. In other words, first place, the kingdom of God, because that's where your resources is. Seek the kingdom of God. And again, Matthew 6.33, it says, and his righteousness. We're not going to get into that this morning, but righteousness is a key to unlocking the kingdom of heaven into your life. And he says, all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And so what, God, what Jesus is trying to do is get us into a kingdom mindset. But what I want you to notice here in verse 22 again, he said, therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Well, he started that by saying, therefore, therefore, which means that was the continuation of a thought. Anytime you see a therefore in the Bible, you need to see what it's there for. Amen. So we're going to see what the therefore is there for. Let's go back to verse 13. One of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divides his, the inheritance with me. This guy wanted, he wasn't really concerned about their, his relationship with his brother as much as he was concerned about the money that needed to come to him. Isn't that interesting? 
He said, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus said, man, who made me a judge and a divider over you? I'm just going to kind of give you some little nuggets of truth as we go through this. Do you think that Jesus could have done a good job dividing the inheritance? Do you think he could have done a good job of being a judge between them? Do you think his judgment would have been right? Why didn't Jesus do it? That wasn't his assignment. That wasn't his assignment. As a matter of fact, you find in another place that he said, I'm not sent, but except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When he was here on the earth, he had an assignment. He had a gifting, a calling, and that was to minister to the Jewish people first and then to be savior for the entire world. And so just because he could do something doesn't mean that he should do something because God had called him to something. Same thing for us. Know what God has called you to do and then stick to that calling. A great way to to kill somebody's vision is to cause your vision to be divided. It's called division. If you if you start trying to do everything and try to be all things to all people and you lose your focus off of what God has called you to do, I mean, just because you can do it don't mean you should do it. And so Jesus understood that he was about the Father's will. And that's what he was gifted and called to do. Amen. So he said, man, who made me a judge or divider over you? And he said unto them, take heed, beware of covetousness. So he's about to start talking about covetousness. And this is something that is talked about all through the Bible, all through the New Testament, and how covetousness will rob you of what God wants to do in your life. Covetousness. What is covetousness? Well, uh, uh, it has to do with wanting sometimes, desiring what other people have, desiring what other businesses have. It also, uh, it also talks about um, uh, uh, the way that you feel about wealth and money and things like that and that you just want to get more and more and more and, and keep it for yourself and that sort of thing. And so this is what was happening. This guy was wanting what his brother had. Now, I don't know if the, if the brother was right or not in not dividing the inheritance, but that's not the issue. The issue is it's God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom and that your prosperity or your success or your financial picture should not be based on what other people do. It should not be based on, it really shouldn't even be based on your job. It really shouldn't even be based on, uh, on, on, on what's happening in your other relationships. It really, you need to have, he's trying to get us into a kingdom mentality when it comes to our financial picture, when it comes to our finances. Amen. Kingdom, what Jesus came to do was to change everything. Listen, to change everything about our lives, to get us to think, start thinking kingdom in every area of our life. And there's no area that's more important than our finances. Our finances represents our time. Our finances represents our hard work. Our, rep, our finances, you know, we, I mean, our money represents, you know, what we can go buy stuff with. Our money represents what I can afford to eat. Our money represents all these things now. And so if you want to, if you really want to find out what it means to live in the kingdom, you need to start here. As a matter of fact, hold your finger here. Let me show you how how important this is. In Luke chapter 16, in Luke chapter 16, and if you'll look at verse 10, he had just spent uh, the whole chapter here talking about um, being a good steward over what had been entrusted to you. And he's talking about finances. And he says in verse 10, he that is faithful in that which is least. And what he's saying is that uh, not, not little as in a number, but he's talking about in value. He's saying finances should be the least thing that if you're faithful in, and you can read the context of it, he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. He that is unjust in least is unjust also in much. So if therefore... You have not been faithful in the unrighteous, unrighteous mammon. That's the, that's, uh, that's the spirit of, of covetousness, the spirit of, uh, of, of, of um, money that has gripped this world and this world system. If you've not been faithful over that, who will commit to your trust the true riches, which tells me that money isn't true riches. The amount of money I have in my bank doesn't determine how wealthy I really am. 
not in God's economy, not in kingdom economy. We've got to change our thinking to kingdom thinking. And we've got to value what the kingdom values. All right. And the amount of money in your bank isn't what the kingdom values. All right. Um, uh, uh, now, God, God blesses. God blessed Abraham. Abraham was very wealthy. He was rich. He was all of those things. But God said, I have blessed you to be a blessing. And Abraham was that way. All right. And so we'll talk about that. So he's saying here that faithfulness in our finances and how we steward that is important. Go back to Luke chapter 12. And so he said, take heed and beware of covetousness for a man's life. Again, life, your life, what's going on from the inside out. That is more important than what's going on on the outside. Your life, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things which he possesses. Does not consist in the things that he possesses. He spoke a parable unto them. The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. I want you to notice a couple of things here. This man was not a poor man. This parable right now is about a rich man. This guy was already successful. He was already blessed. And so he had a particular year that his ground, that his crops, I mean, it produced like it never produced before. It was a bountiful harvest. It was an amazing bonus that came his way. So the ground of a certain rich man. You know, a lot of times preachers, uh, some preachers see it. Uh, and, and what's great about this, I can talk about these things and finances in the kingdom this, because the church is doing as well as it ever has financially. And so we're not looking for way, you know, if, if there's ever a thought, well, maybe he's just preaching this because... Uh, he's trying to get us to give more. No, it's not that at all. You know, God supplies the need and we thank God that we're in position to be a blessing the way that we have been. Thank God for that. But um, because, it, because scriptures about giving or scriptures about finances have been so abused um, by churches or so abused by ministers on television, um, you know, to try to, to try to use it as, a, as an appeal or as an emotional hook to try to get you to give. Um, I've, I've, st- I've stayed away. I haven't preached about finances in two years. I've stayed away from it just, you know, just for that very reason. And the Lord just kind of got all over me and said, are you going to preach the truth of my word to the church or are you just going to keep backing off because you're afraid what people may think the motivation is? And so we're going to get down into the nitty-gritty about some kingdom things because he wants you to be blessed and he wants you to be a part of the kingdom. He's blessing you to be a blessing. He's blessing you to, to, to be able to hook up with missions and churches and, and, and to help people. Praise God. Our value system has to change to his value system. All right, so here's a rich man who had a great bountiful harvest. And so what he did is he thought within himself saying, so what am I going to do? I want you to see that he's not thinking like kingdom. He's not saying, God, what should I do with this? He never went to the Lord about this. He said, what am I going to do? Because I, notice, notice the focus here, I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, so this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my or store my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. So take your ease, eat, drink and be merry. Do we see do we see a theme here? Man he, he was all about him. First of all, he made a mistake by thinking that the harvest came because of, of what he did. He didn't cause the rain to come. He didn't cause the ground to produce. He was blessed by God. God says, honor him with your substance, the first fruits of your increase. So shall your barns be filled with plenty. Your presses will burst out with new wine. God is a blessing God. God is a bountiful God. But recognize that everything that you have came from God. The education you have, the intelligence that you have, the degree that you have, the job that you have, 
All of that came because God is working in your life. And, you, and we, have, as a kingdom-minded people, have got to start thinking and thanking God for what He has done and His blessing in our life. When He showed up to Abram in Genesis chapter 12, He says, I am, uh, he says, I am the Lord, I'm going to bless you, and you'll be a blessing. But recognize your blessing is from Me. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18, can you pull that up? Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 18. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy. That's an old song. But thou shalt remember the Lord your God, for it is He that gives you the power, the ability to get wealth. Notice that He didn't say for it is He that gives you wealth. He said it's you, He that gives you the ability, the power to get wealth, that He may establish His covenant with you. He's doing this for you, but everything that you have, we've got to have a grateful heart. We've got to have a thanksgiving heart. We've got to recognize we are stewarding the resources that has come out of his kingdom into our life. This man here says, I'm just going to store it up for myself. Had nobody else in mind but himself. But God said to him, verse 20, Luke chapter 12, verse 20. But God said to him, you fool. Now look at this. This guy was rich. This guy was wealthy. Everything that he did, it seemed to be going well. And the world would have called him smart. The world would have called him intelligent. The world would have, the world would have wanted to, to be like him. Teach me how you did this. Tell me what you did to gain all of this extra uh, bountiful. What fertilizer did you use? Is there a secret to your success? So the world would have been going, you know, knocking down his door to try to learn from him. But God said, you fool. The ways of God are different than the ways of the world. You, you fool, your life is the most important thing. You're not focusing on what's important. He says, your soul is going to be required of you tonight. Then whose things will all of this be? You didn't think about who you could bless. You didn't think about who you could help. That was not your first thought. Your first thought is, when I got my bonus, when I got my tax return, when I got, wasn't, how can I help others? It was, how can I help myself? How can, I, how can I be a blessing to the kingdom instead of figuring out how I can just receive? Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Paul said in a different place, he said, you, you, can't, you, you didn't come into, anything with, uh, into this world with anything and you certainly can't carry it out. You've never seen a hearse dragging a U-Haul with it. Right? This night, whose things will those be which you have provided? So is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Just because you're rich doesn't, just because you're wealthy, just because you have money, and some of you are here say, I don't have money, so this doesn't apply to me. You can be just as greedy and covetous and not have anything as a person that's rich that won't give anything. You can be rich, but according to this, you will not be rich towards God. Therefore, he says, I say unto you, lay not. Take, not, take no thought for your life or what you shall eat, neither for your body what you shall put on. Jesus came to give us a different mindset. The kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is in all of us to be able to expand and to use what has been given to us to expand the kingdom. Turn with me over to uh, um, uh, Philippians chapter 4. So he's talking about that. As a matter of fact, I'll read this. Um, um, 
in verse 32 of, of, of Luke 12, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's. I want you to get the heart. The heart, Jesus isn't trying to get you just to give so you don't have anything. He said, fear not, little flock, for it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So sell what you have. Give alms. Have a giving lifestyle. We should, we should have a heart to give. And I'm not talking about just giving to church. Giving to church is important. We get to come together as a body of believers and we get to be able to sow into life of faith church and to help uh, as as we pay bills and as we, as we continue to expand the ministry, we get to sow and see what God is going to do. He gives us the kingdom. Thank God. And we should make that a part of our, our weekly giving. Amen? I mean, that's why he says, honor the Lord with, the, with your substance, with the first fruits. I'm, so I'm not being ashamed about that at all. That is something that if you're going to come and you want to be a part of a, of a local body, don't just show up on Sunday morning just to receive, but rather out of your heart, give and and. and and, and what you do with your finances expresses where your heart is. Amen. I'm just telling you the truth. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, and so a lot of times if we're not, if we haven't made the decision that we're going to connect with the church that we're a part of with our finances, then really our heart's not there according to Jesus' definition, but rather our bodies can be here, our minds can be here, but our heart's not really there. We are the kingdom of God in operation together. So we get to do this together and, 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 and uh, 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 continue to expand the kingdom together. And so he says, sell what you have, give alms, have a giving lifestyle. But that also means give to the poor, find other ministries to get, find other people to bless. It's not just about what you do. A lot of people would take this and say, no, you need to tithe and give to your church and make sure. No, it's not about what you do to your church. It's what, what you're doing with your life. Who are you blessing? Who are you giving? When money comes in, are you looking at it and saying, God, how can I be a blessing to somebody else? Or are you saying, God, how can I pay my bills? You may say, well, I don't have enough money to, to be able to give right now. Well, then find something. The Bible says faith without works is dead. You can say, I can, I'm believing God. You know, if you don't give a thing, does God still love you? Yes, he does. If you, if you don't ever give to another church or give to another ministry or give to another person, does God still love you? Yes, he does. But the fact of the matter is, by not connecting with the kingdom thought and kingdom thinking concerning your finances, you are limiting what God can do in you and you're limiting what God can do through you. What happens when we have a giving lifestyle? He says, sell what you have, give alms. Don't provide yourself, you know, like uh, storage things that wax not old. A treasure in, in the heavens that fails not. As you give, there's a treasure in heaven that fails not. Where no thief approaches, neither uh, moth corrupt. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. In, in Philippians chapter 4, in Philippians chapter 4, it says this. He's talking to the Philippians about their giving and the fact that they help, helped him out. And so he says um, in verse 10, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the, at the last your care of me has flourished again. You're giving and you're helping me as I go out into all of these places where you are also careful. You also always want to do it, but you didn't have the opportunity. He says, Now I do not speak. In respect of want. He says, because I've learned in whatever state to be content. I've learned where I am. God's going to supply my need. Your faith, your trust, and particularly ministers, your faith and your trust has to be in God. Not in people, not in mailing lists, not in partnership, not in all of that. You trust God. God, Jesus sent the disciples out and he said, don't take an offering bucket with you. Don't take storage. Don't take an extra set of clothes with you because a workman is worthy of his hire. If you're doing what God's called you to do, God will take care of you. Praise God for that. And so he talks about all of those things. But then he says this, I can do all things, verse 13, through Christ, which strengthens me. And so in verse 15, now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church, nobody else communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. But even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent to my need. 
He said, but I'm telling you this, look at this, verse 17, not because I desire a gift. He knew where his trust was. I'm telling you this this morning, not because life of faith needs your money or needs you to give. That's not the reason why. Because we're blessed. We have money in the bank. Every bill is paid. Glory to God. We've got things in the works that's happening. It's awesome. So thank God for that. Not that I desire a gift, but he says, I desire that fruit may abound to your account. He recognized that in giving, when you start thinking about giving and your finances from a kingdom standpoint, you listen, you need the kingdom of God involved in your finances. And I don't care how much money you have in the bank. Just because you have it don't mean it's because that, that, that you're good to go. One more scripture and then I'll tell a story in close. And then we'll, we'll dig into this some more next week and really see how this operates. In 1 first, uh, in first Timothy chapter 6. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. Paul, instructing this young minister Timothy as he was going about to different churches, said this. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor that they trust in uncertain riches, but that their trust still stays in the living God who gives to us richly all things to enjoy. You know, God still wants you to enjoy what he gives you. He just don't want you to hoard it all up for yourself. Give, be a blessing to others. Help others. Thank God for it. That they do good. That they be, tell them to do good. Be rich in good works. So money in the bank doesn't equal good works in your life. Not only, not, not only and, and sometimes, sometimes, listen, and this is, this is from poor to rich or whatever, sometimes we think giving money will alleviate the responsibility of me going out and being a demonstrator of the kingdom. Let me give to another minister. Let him do the work. No, the Bible says that we were created in Christ Jesus for good works. And so, yes, your money can help other people do good works, but you also need to be rich in good works. Let Jesus be manifested through you. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cast out devils. I mean, go out and demonstrate the kingdom in every area in your life. Help people get saved and come to know the living Christ. Amen. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to give, willing to communicate. And by doing this, verse 19, they lay up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So being rich towards God, as what, as what uh, Jesus was talking about, is how you steward the money that's coming in. You know, we have a lot of people that volunteer here at the church. You know, thank God for the time that they, that they volunteer here at the church. You know, but that, that volunteer time doesn't replace what you do with your finances. See? Because you've got to be good steward over what comes in to you and say, I want the kingdom of God. I want to, I want to be invested fully into what, into what God is doing. I want, to, I want to honor him with my substance. We've got to let go of some things in our heart and so, so that through our heart the kingdom of God can be manifested here in the earth. Years ago, 30 years ago, when my dad first started this church, we have a gentleman here uh, in the church that he was making maybe $600 a week. And he determined, he decided within himself, he said, I want to be a blessing to the kingdom. I'm going to start giving. I, want, I, want to, I, I can't afford to give, but I'm going to, I'm going to, have the, I'm going to be a, a giver. I want my life to be the life of a giver. And so he, he went beyond 10%. He decided to start giving $100 a week. But he didn't do it just so that God would bless him. He did it because his heart was to help the ministry and to connect with the kingdom of God and to expand that. And so over the years, God has blessed him and blessed him and given him a business and blessed him and blessed him to, uh, to the point that within 10 to 15 years, he, God blessed him so much that he became the largest supporter of this church. 
And because, because of that, because of connecting to the kingdom in that way and, allow, and, and continuing to be a giver, and not just, I, I can't tell you the ministries that he's given to and, and the people that he has helped. And, and I mean, I'm talking about he has helped so many people outside of this church and blessed so many people. So it hasn't been limited to this church. But during a season and during times that, um, that this church was, was having a difficult time financially, if it wasn't for the fact that that man was here and that God had blessed him and he had a heart to give, I promise you that this church would not have made it. Because he, because, because he had made a decision to connect with, with, with the heart of God. That God said, I can trust you and set him up to be a blessing to this church. And today, he's still the largest supporter of this church. Gives Somebody that started out giving $100 a week, $5,000 a year, $5,200 a year to this day. Now the Lord is blessed so much that he's able to give over $50,000 a year to this church. And still, and still does it joyfully and is upset when he can't do maybe one week, not just as good of a week in his business or something like that. And the people that he is able to help, God has increased them so much that, that, that his community has been impacted. He has, listen, he hasn't just helped this church. He hasn't just, you know, helped us and had a heart for different ministries. He has impacted his community because of what he's been able to do and how God's been. How God's blessed them. And the things and the things that he has raised up and that they've been able to do in their community. That's kingdom. That God blesses you to the place that you're not so concerned about yourself, but you're able to bless others. And, you, and you're able to impact people around you. And they see the king on the inside of you. And you're demonstrating the king. And you're giving glory to God for everything that he has done in your life. And you're, and you're saying, he's the one that did it. I didn't do it. I couldn't do it by myself. If it wasn't for God, I wouldn't be here today. Come on, let's give God praise. Thank God. Thank you, Lord. And so, and so as, as, as we look at this and, and, and conclude this thing next week, I want you to really, I, I want you to think about it. How interested are you in having every area of the kingdom of God operating in your life and, being, and truly being, being a, a son, being a daughter, being a child of the king, do you, do you have a mindset that your hand is out not to receive from others, but your hand is out because you're blessed by the king to give and to bless? And you want to be a blessing in other people's lives. That's what it means to be rich towards God, to lay up things for yourselves. And, I mean, to lay up for yourself things in heaven. It's out of your giving. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, he says that we give cheerfully, bountifully, that we would be, that he'll make all grace abound towards us. All grace. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity, Father, to connect with your kingdom, to let our mindset. And Father, you take care, you take care of your own. You take care of us. It is, it is your good pleasure to give us the kingdom. You've You've blessed the people here in this church. You've blessed this church so much. And Father, we're just grateful for that. Lord, we know. We know it's by, by your hand and we know it's by what you've done. But Father, that, that it's your desire to work through us and to, to increase us as we can be a part of, uh, of, of your kingdom and be a part of, of, of your mission and live that way and, and live to give. And truly connect with your heart. You make all grace abound towards us. That we would require no aid or support. But we would be able to give the word of God says to every. Every opportunity. Every charitable donation. That you multiply the seed that's sown. 
Father, help us to, to move our economy back to the economy of heaven and think, think like heaven with regards to our finances. And if, if, if there's some of us here that, that maybe giving has been a difficult thing, we, haven't, we didn't look like that we've had enough, then I just say just find a dollar. Find five dollars. I remember, I remember, I remember. You know, my dad years ago when uh, he'd say that we were we were too poor to pay attention. That he just made a decision. I'm just going to start giving a dollar a day to a ministry, and just find something. Surely, surely you can give up a McDonald's meal. Surely you can find something during the week to say, you know what? I am going to be. I am going to connect with the kingdom. I want my life to be the life of a giver. And so I'll find something, even if it's loose change, I'll find something to begin giving, you know. And then talk to the Lord about the places you would like to give. Yes, give to the church. Be a part of that. We're, we're a body that works together. But also find other areas where you can give. But sometimes you have to, you have to just make a... You can't wait for God just to say, I want you to give now. He's already declared it in your word. You're responsible for how you're going to take what the word of God says. You're responsible for stepping that out.